let's backspin some mead with honey. Now, why might you want to back sweeten the mead with a different kind of honey that you use for fermentation? Well, there's a few reasons. One, maybe it's a really cool honey, but you only could get a few ounces of it. They sell like sample packs sometimes, and they're not, maybe it's a really expensive honey. And if you wanted to make, and if you want to make an entire batch of mead with that honey, it might be really expensive. Honey's already not the cheapest thing to ferment with. So, when you start getting more pricier honeys, it can add up real quick. Well, you can take a two gallon bucket or a five gallon bucket, three gallon fermenter, whatever the case may be, break it down into gallons, and then backspin in each one with a different type of honey. And then you can compare, wow, this is the characteristic I get from this honey. This is the flavor profiles I get from this honey. And it starts to really educate you personally on what kind of honeys you liked in your mead. In this case, I'm using Pacific Northwest Blackberry Honey from Bees Knees Honey Co., which is an awesome little company. They make amazing products. And, and I really want to use this honey in a mead. Uh, but it's, it's on the pricier side, and it's delicious honey. And when you ferment with a honey, you actually lose some of those flavor characteristics, those little nuances from the honey itself during fermentation. If I back sweeten with it, I'm going to get all of those really cool flavor notes in my final product. Uh, and my method today for doing this is going to be pasteurization. Now I'm going to put a note on that. You can stabilize it. You can buy, uh, they actually make full blown wine stabilizing powders. You can use a combination of uh, metabisulfates or other sulfates, things of that nature. I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not going to pretend to be. And I'm not going to tell you how to do that. There's plenty of videos online that show you how to stabilize a brew, uh, and there's plenty of research out there. If that's what you want to do, go do it. More power to you. If you're doing a five-gallon batch, this might not be the best method, just because I can pasteurize one gallon. I don't know that I have the equipment to pasteurize five gallons, unless I break it down into one-gallon carboys and do it that way. So I'm going to use the pasteurization method, and if you follow along, you'll still see some really cool ways how to back sweeten. But just be mindful that that's one way to do it, and there's still other ways out there to do it. Do whatever works best for you, and have a good time while you're doing it. So the first thing I'm going to do today is rather simple. It's what I do when I start any brew on my second time or third time of playing around with it. I'm going to take a reading. So we're going to remove the airlock. Take our hydrometer, turkey baster, and just see if it's finished, see what the gravity is, and that'll give us a little bit of insight on what we should do today. Well, it definitely smells like mead. And we are at a 0.999, which is cool. That means that this mead actually went to about 14%. This is a standard traditional recipe for mead. I'm sure I have it posted somewhere on exactly what the ingredients were in here. Um, I didn't keep notes on this one because it was a tester jug. It's really just a simple mead. There's not a lot to it. it smells good. It smells young, but it smells good. I'm going to carefully pour this into the pitcher. And you want to do that because if I pour it back into the fermenter, I'm going to kick up some of that lease, and I worked hard to get that lease to settle out. So I don't want to get it into secondary, especially not with what's going on today. Now we're going to elevate this. I'm using my auto siphon today. Now, it has this little cap that really controls, or tries to control, at least helps prevent some of this lease from getting into my pitcher. It's a really cool little tool. And I use it to get basically this liquid into this pitcher without pouring it. It works on a gravity feed. As long as this one is elevated higher than this one, it's going to basically use gravity to force the liquid out of here and move it into this pitcher. Really simple. You just put one end in one side, this end halfway down in this one. Give it a few pumps and it should start right away. 
Then you can uh, slowly lower it into this vessel. And if you do it right, you won't get really any sediment from here into here. Now, when it gets a little bit too close to that cap, I do like to carefully tilt the pitcher or the carboy up. And that helps. Um, you want to keep an eye on it at this point because if the sediment starts moving too close to the entrance, you might have to cut it a little early. But this is going to help you get a little bit more product than you might have got otherwise. And that's about what I could get without getting really that whole least cake into the brew. You'll see there's a little bit of loss here. Whenever you make mead, there's going to be a little bit of loss. You can't let it get to you. Yes, you could let this sit for a while. And yes, you might be able to get a few more drops out of it. But at the end of the day, you're not going to get much more. And it's really not worth the hassle. So now, I don't really need this for the moment. I'm going to let it drain out of the bottom. Flow through the funnel. Really, I just don't want to wear it is the key here. So now I'm going to push this to the side for now. And we're going to open our honey, which is kind of sad because it was such a nice packaging. It smells really good. If you sanitize a fork or a chopstick or something, feel free to steal a little sample to taste. You should taste it. I've actually never had the blackberry one from them before, so I'm curious myself. Mm. It's so good. So, until I started making mead, I never realized how complex certain honeys could be. And really, it's just, it really is just like, it's, it's amazing sometimes, like to try different honeys and like just get those little tiny different characteristics. Or in some cases, those big, bold flavors that some honeys can have. This tastes like a really nice honey with like hints of blackberry in it. It's awesome. It's going to do well in this mead. I'm excited about it. We don't need the hydrometer anymore. I do need a scale, so give me one second on that. So we're going to weigh the pitcher with the meat in it. We're going to tear it. And I like to add around half a pound of honey when I'm trying something. So about eight ounces. Then we're going to stir it all in, and then we're going to try it. Make sure it's sweet enough. Keep in mind, you have to do these steps all within the same few hours of starting. If my phone rings and I have to leave and I add honey to this, that honey's going to start to ferment. It's going to kick up a new fermentation because this yeast has a little bit of activity left in it. And I'm not trying to ferment this honey. I want to actually taste the honey as the sweetener in this mead. Also, while stirring this, be very careful. Uh, this is an active fermentation. There is alcohol present in here. Uh, there is alcohol present in here, and you can oxidize your brew at this stage. So you don't want to splash it if you could at all avoid it. But if you don't mix it, you're not going to really taste the honey. So. It is nice that this brew is only a few weeks old, so there's still plenty of gases in here. I can see it off-gassing as I'm doing this. And that's a good little security blanket. Is it foolproof? No, not at all. You still have to be careful. But it's a little insurance, and I'll take whatever I can get right now, right? Yeah, it looks pretty good. We're going to steal a little sample. And, 
And really, it's going to taste like a young mead. So it's not going to be the best thing you've ever tried at this stage. And you're not looking for it to be. You really want to see how much of the honey do you taste that you just added. And is it enough to your preference? For me, that's good. That's wonderful. It's just sweet enough. It's a semi-sweet meat at this point. I taste the honey. I like the amount of honey. If you like things sweeter, you might have to do more than 8 ounces of honey. You might have to do 10 or 12. Build it up slowly because you can't take it back once it's in there. So I'd always say start with half a pound for back sweetening. Mix it up thoroughly. Try it. Is it sweet enough? Either good or not. And then add a little bit more if you want a little bit more. I could add a little bit more, but... I also don't tend to drink overly sweet products. But maybe another two ounces. Just to, you know, why not? And just like before, we're going to mix it all in. Yeah. So all in all, I'm adding 10 ounces of honey to this one. And I like it. It's really good. So now we're going to put this one, we're going to elevate it, remove the scale that we no longer need, take a clean sanitized carboy, and just like before, we're going to take the bottling wand, not bottling wand, we're going to take our auto siphon, take the cap off the bottom. So now this can go right to the bottom and take every drop of liquid with minimal help from our part. We don't need the cap because we already got it off the sediment and there's nothing in here I'm trying to avoid getting into here. Right inside, repeat on this one, couple good pumps, and let it go. All right, so we're good. Let me just move this over for a second. So now we're ready to pasteurize. So there's a few pieces of equipment you're going to need. You're going to need an instant read thermometer that can reach the level of your liquid. You're going to need, if you don't have an instant read thermometer, you can also use a probe thermometer or like one of those meter candy thermometers with a string that has like a magnitude that you can stick to the back of your uh, oven. That works really well too. Uh, you need a pot that's big enough to hold a one gallon fermenter. And you need to make sure there's some kind of towels or something on the bottom. If you have if you have a rack that can go on the bottom here, that is also really well. You just can't have this on the very bottom of this. As the water starts to bubble, it might agitate this, start shaking it, and you could shatter your brew. You don't want to shatter your brew. Uh, you would just waste everything. You'd have a watery, glassy, meaty mess. Not what we're going for today. So you want to be careful. So put a couple towels down. This can go right into your pot. And now well, you want to fill this with enough water, ideally, to match the level of the mead in the fermenter. We're then going to bring heat to it, and you want to monitor it, because you only have to bring this to 140. I'd say keep it strictly between 140 and 160 max. Once it hits that, once it hits that temperature, you want to hold it there for about 10 minutes. That's enough to kill any yeast that's still in this brew. Um, if you start to boil it, you're going to start to kill the honey you just put in. Kill some of those nuanced flavors you worked very hard to get into your brew. Not the ideal. You don't want this to boil. Uh, you just want to heat it up until it really hits the temperatures you need it to hit. It's going to be hotter on the outside than it is on the inside. So make sure you take temperatures often. You hit 140, keep the flame steady. Keep it at 140, between 140 and 160. For about 10 minutes. I'm going to do that right now and then I'll be back as soon as we're done. All 
All right, so easy enough process. I did exactly what we talked about, put it on the stove, made sure the water came up to the same line as the mead, let the inside liquid, the mead itself, hit 140. The outside liquid got a little bit hotter than that. Uh, not a big deal either way. It hit about 145 and stayed solidly there for 10 minutes. So I'm sure now any yeast inside of my brew are dead. Uh, it's a surefire way, very safe way to shelf stabilize a mead that you added more sugar to after it had finished ferment, uh, fermenting. But I didn't want to re-ferment. Um, not the worst process. Obviously not something you have to do to every single mead. Especially if you drink your meads on the drier side or you back sweeten with a non-fermentable sugar such as erythritol. Easy, easy. But um, now I'm going to carefully. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention. You don't want the fermenter to hit the sides, the metal sides of um, your pot. Kind of, you have to play operation, can't touch the sides. It could cause some shock to the fermenter if you let it hit the side, which could cause it to break. And while this has cooled now for about another 20 minutes, it's still relatively hot. It's really hot. It's still steaming. I want to put an airlock on it, and I want to get it out of the water so it could start to cool down a little bit faster. So I'm going to place it on a towel on my table, and it's pretty much going to sit here for the next 10 to 12 hours before I touch it again. So I'd put it somewhere where it's not going to be direct sunlight, and it will be safe in that one spot. Put it on a towel. Do not put it on a solid surface. Something like stone, granite. I mean, even linoleum, I'd be careful with because if it's too cold, you're going to shock the glass and you could potentially break your fermenter and ruin your whole batch. Carefully. Also, be careful. I have pretty heat resistant hands. If you don't, you might want to use a towel for that. I'm also going to put an airlock back on now, and it's fine. Um, if there is any pressure that builds up in here, It'll go right through the airlock. It's not going to be a big deal. Um, I don't like keeping the fermenter without an airlock on it any longer than I physically need to. And what's really going to happen now is... Well, you might ask yourself. Why did you, why did you pasteurize the full gallon and not bottle it first? And I have a few really easy answers for that. One, I added more honey. And this got super cloudy again. In my experience, after you pasteurize a brew, even a brew that's pretty clear, it clears out more. And I don't want a bunch of sediment at the bottom of my bottles, especially if I give them out to people. So I like to let it clear out in the fermenter, which is why I do the full gallon. It's not that much work. Uh, it's easier than bottling and then pasteurizing, in my opinion. It's one thing. I only had to keep an eye on one vessel. Yeah, it's a big pot, but... It's not that heavy, all in all, and it was easy enough to do. I also can see that this degassed quite a lot while in the, um, this degassed quite a lot while it was in the pot, and you can see that little like line of foam. That's all off gassing happening right now. Perfectly natural. Uh, pasteurizing seems to help off gas a little bit quicker, and I have a feeling that even in a couple days from now, this is going to be a lot clearer. And it's going to have a lot less gases in it, which means it's going to be drinkable sooner. So if I bottle this in a week from now, I'm going to have a shelf-stable, ready-to-go bottle. Uh, if you are cautious, if you aren't sure, you can take a gravity reading right now, take the gravity reading again in a few days, and as long as it's the same gravity reading, you know that fermentation has stopped. The yeast are dead, which they should be. If you have a yeast colony that survives pasteurization, keep that colony. That's like MVPs right there. But it doesn't really happen. I've never seen it happen. I've never really heard about it happening. So I'm not worried. And I'm really excited about drinking this mead in a week from now and getting all those really cool honey notes from it. So what's next? Next steps are going to be bottling, which is easy enough. And I'll make a video to show you guys that plus a tasting. Uh, but all in all, this is a great way to try out honeys you might not have tried out in a mead otherwise. I might never have grabbed three pounds or two and a half pounds of 
Northwest blackberry honey and made a mead with it. But now I know what that's going to taste like. And it's awesome because it's a nice, rich, complex flavor. Again, same if you used a buckwheat honey would work great for this. Meadow sweet honey. Any of those strong pack a punch honeys that would lose some of their flavors and nuances during fermentation. I back sweetened with this and it's, it's essentially a blackberry honey mead, which is awesome. And if, you know, try it out for yourself. Try different honeys. Try local honeys. Try Bees Knees Honey Co. Uh, they're great. They're on Etsy. I'll put their link in the description. Awesome products. Not sponsored by them, by the way, but could be willing to. Uh, <laughs> but no, anytime you have a chance to try a great honey out in a mead, I say go for it. And this is just a safe and fun way to get a good product and a great end result. But that's all I have for today, guys. If you like this video, please go ahead, click that like button. Any questions, comments, or concerns, go ahead and leave them in the comments. I'd be happy to answer anything you want to ask. And if you want to see the follow up to this video or some other great mead videos, please uh, subscribe and you'll always be notified when I release new content. I'm Phil. This is Phil with Facts. And until next time, cheers.